when the director's son is around, you know, and I'm going back to when I was five on Oxbow Incident, I mean, no one's going to be, no one's going to treat the director's son badly, right? <laughs> but on Yellow Sky, the only one that really paid attention to me was Richard Widmark. And I think I found out at that early age that a lot of times the villains are the nicest guys. Well, as we continue our tribute to Lone Pine, there were so many films that were shot there. And one of my all-time favorites, and this is before I even knew about Lone Pine and, and knew to recognize the rock formations. It starred Gregory Peck, and it was Richard Widmark's first Western, and Widmark was wonderful in this. So the film was directed by William Wellman, who had been a pilot in World War I and directed the classic film Wings. There's a wonderful documentary called Wild Bill, because that was his nickname, and that documentary was produced by his son, William Wellman, Jr., an actor, producer, who is here today. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Bill. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad to be here. I, I've loved Lone Pine uh, since I was 11 years old. Were you on location? When my father made Yellow Sky, that was... I went on 27 of my father's films, sets and locations. And if it was not school time, like summer, then I would get to go the whole time. And on Yellow Sky, I was there in Lone Pine for the whole shoot. And it was just fabulous. And they, they, he, my father, I roomed with my father. I would go out to the set with him. How old were you then? 11. Mm -hmm. And then he would just let me go. And I would take care of myself. I mean, I was always excited about movies and, and the people that, that made it happen. I had a lot of time sitting on Ann Baxter's lap. <laughs> uh, Actually, uh, I think I sat on more laps of famous people than my father made movies. I, mean, I, I got a whole list of them and a lot of pictures, too. So I loved Lone Pine right from then. Uh, the first time I went there for a festival was 1998, and they honored my father. Actually, I have the belt buckle here. And I don't think I've missed more than three or four years since 1998. Well, tell us a little bit about the shooting of Yellow Sky, because, you know, that was a long time ago, before, around 1948, I think, before uh, Lone Pine was quite as well known as it is today, and Gregory Peck hadn't done westerns before. This is before he did Gunfighter, and it, just a great script as well. Yeah, it, it was an... Uh... My father and Gregory Peck were not a match made in heaven. Uh, and I think the world of Gregory Peck. I mean, this is one of the finest gentlemen, one of the finest actors and finest people that I've ever met in the business. And I was able to work with him on several other war films like MacArthur and Porkchop Hill. He was fantastic. But he was um, not the extrovert that my father was. My father is hooting and hollering and swearing and, you know, and this was not Gregory Peck. And my father was concerned that Gregory Peck was not tough enough to play this character in the film. So my father devised a new scene where Gregory Peck kicks John Russell in the head early in the picture so that from then on you knew you didn't fool with Gregory Peck. It worked. It worked. But Gregory Peck had broken his ankle. And if you see that movie, he's running around on those rocks in the Alabama hills, never squawked. Now, he didn't hang out at the bars with, with the rest of the, the actors and crew and all that. He kind of stayed by himself. And I think that alienated him a little bit with some of the people. Even Ann Baxter was not real happy that he wasn't, you know, one of the boys. But that just wasn't Gregory Peck. And in the scene where Gregory Peck and Ann Baxter have that fight where they're rolling around in the corral, my father just told her, he says, just beat that shit. <laughs> <laughs> and she did, and she did. Academy Award winner, Ann Baxter, as a girl who lives like a man, 
bites like a tigress, but responds to a kiss like a woman. He, he would get up, dust himself off, never a word, never a squawk. He was absolutely fantastic. And by the time the picture was over, my father was a fan. And um, when I did the documentary on my father, when I interviewed Gregory Peck, he said, you know, I love working for your father. I mean, he was absolutely fantastic. I wish we could have done more films together. That's great. It's a wonderful film. Now, what was Richard Widmark like? Because, again, he was a New York actor, a radio, big uh, radio actor. He loved working on radio. And this was, he had just come from Kiss of Death, he did. where he had pushed the old lady down the stairs and laughed about it. And didn't want to be typecast, I know, uh, in that sort of role. But here he was playing another bad guy, but with a bit more warmth. When the director's son is around, you know, and I'm going back to when I was five on Oxbow Incident, I mean, no one's going to be, no one's going to treat the director's son badly, right? <laughs> but on Yellow Sky, the only one that really paid attention to me was Richard Widmark. And I think I found out at that early age that a lot of times the villains are the nicest guys. And Widmark was spent, he'd take me out for milkshakes at the end of the day, and he spent time with me that he didn't have to do. And um, I just thought he was great. And I also interviewed him for the documentary, and he was just fantastic. And he got along great with my father. And did you all stay at the Dow Villa when you were yep. there? Mm -hmm. stayed at the Dow, as many as they could get in. I don't know where the, uh, all of the company, because they didn't really have that many rooms. They still don't. <laughs> <laughs> Another now, icon, a Western icon, who was uh, a military hero, Audie Murphy. You did a film with Audie Murphy as well. Uh, what was he like on set? Was he as intense as, as we read about? I, I just found him to be very quiet, very unassuming, uh, treated everybody well, but he was mostly just very quiet. I found him to be a little bit unusual that way. He just, you know, it was like he he didn't want to be there, but he was there, and he had a job to do, and he was going to do it, but he just was very unassuming. And he knew his lines. He was there. He oh, had yeah. his mark. He oh, yeah. DeForest Kelly, Bones, was uh, a villain in that film with you, uh, Gunfight at Comanche Creek with Audie <laughs> Murphy. Yeah, the, the film was so, they had to, narrate the whole picture when they looked at that they couldn't figure out what the hell happened so there's a there's a narrator who was what boston blackie or something narrates the whole picture so that you know even the time of day to make sure you know you knew what the hell was going on that's a giveaway that's so a giveaway. I, I i did two have gun will travels in lone pine I'll, I'll cue a story i think you'll appreciate when as an actor and i started in 1956 and within a couple of years, I figured if I'm going to be a working actor, I'm going to be doing Westerns. So I went to a photographer, the wrong one, the guy who does Elizabeth Taylor and Kim Novak. And I bought this Western outfit, all black, black. Hat. A saloon dress. Yeah. Right. I even have a, you know, bought myself a six gun and, you know, and I'm all in black and I, and I've got these, these looks, you know, flying, all this stuff because I figured out, you know, I, I got to get westerns or I'm not going to work. And they looked at you for seven brides for seven yeah, brothers. <laughs> Howard Keel got my role. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, I get it. My first interview for for a western is Hab Gun Will Travel. And I've got my pictures, and I put the outfit on, and in I go. And there's Paladin. Now, this was highly unusual because stars did not go to, to casting sessions. But there he was, sitting there looking at me, looking at my picture, and looking at me dressed the way I was. And he says to me, hey, kid, nobody dresses in black on this show except me. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my God. So I, I finished. I read something, and I left. And I called my agent. I said, oh, my God, that was a terrible palate. And I think he hated me, didn't like the way I was dressed. I get the role. I get the guest lead in the next show. And I thought, what the heck is this? Well, they were so good to me that every year they, they would call me back and I would do a have gun, one up in Lone Pine, 
And every time Richard Boone would say to me, hey kid, you still got that black outfit? <laughs> So years later, I realized that's why I got the role, because I had a black outfit on. He couldn't forget me. Hey, do you still have that black outfit? Um, no, but I got the gun. Okay, cool. It's the only gun I have, and it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, we just lost one of our, our great Western directors, Andy McLaughlin, who directed all four of your episodes on Have Gun, Will Travel, and a couple of gun smokes, too. Yeah, and also uh, the miniseries The Blue and the Gray. Mm -hmm. And what was he like to he work with? He was fantastic. He did more gun smokes and more Have Gun Will Travels than six, any other director. Six, uh, like a hundred. Or something like Ooh. that. And and he, he was like seven feet tall uh, and, and just passed away, but he was very, very prolific. The son of Victor McLaughlin, who had been an Oscar-winning actor for John Ford and The Informer, of course, was in The Quiet Man, had that great fight with John Wayne. But Andy had been hanging around, was friends with the, the Ford and the Waynes, and then suddenly he was uh, the go-to guy for TV Westerns. And was he fast? Is that what was so? Yeah, well, hey, you, ha you had to shoot those. If it was an hour show, you had to do it in, what, six days? Did what they did do two? They did two back-to-back. -back. The people that they cast, had they had had to have roles in both shows. They weren't going to bring any more actors up, so you were in... If you went up there, you did both shows. And I was up there a couple of years ago, and they w took me out to this valley away from, really, the Alabama hills and the fantastic rocks, this long valley look down there, and they said, that's from the Golden Toad that you did have gun up here. That was the shot, and they, they put this river in down there, and I went, what? So they like to find those things, and they're, they're up there. Um, well, then let me ask you about one film. It's not a Western that I've always found fascinating and just a great movie. TCM ran it again the other day with Frankie Darrell, Wild Boys of the Road. When I saw that as a kid, yeah, it just was frightening. Yeah, it, it's, well, my mother's the, the co-star. Yes, yeah, she's one dressed my disguised as a boy. Yeah. Let's run. Don't, there'll be trouble if you do. I, I think that's one of my favorite films of my father's and it's been sort of, it gets rediscovered all the time. Uh, people just love it. Uh, anytime I I do uh, some sort of a screening event or if they want to put together a retrospective, even a small one, I always say, get Wild Boys of the Road. People love it. It's still shocking and, and a great film. Thank you for being here, Bill. Thank you. Mm -hmm.